Let's get into the scriptures. I invite you to open to the Gospel of John, where uh, last week we discussed chapters one, excuse me, ver- chapter one, verses one through 18. Today we want to continue with that. I'll begin by reading verses 19 through 23. That's, that will be our starting point. John, chapter 1, verses 19 through 23. Follow along with me in your own Bible, or you can read along with my text. The Word of God reads, And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed, and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. The title of today's message is A Faithful Testimony. We will discuss what it means to be a credible witness for Jesus. Pray with me, please. My Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your word. We ask that you open up the word and that you speak to us from the scriptures. We are hungry for your word, hungry to hear from you. We ask, oh God, that you would minister to us and, and, and Lord, give us ears to hear what it is you're saying. Give us a word for this hour. Help us to rightly divide the word of truth at all times for the glory of God and the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, by now, if you are following a plan to read the Bible through in a year, you have probably made your way through some biblical genealogies. You know what I'm talking about. This one begot this one, who begot this one, or or this one was the father of this one, who was the father of this one, who was the father of this one. Bet you never knew there were so many of those in the Bible. I know that it may not make for exciting reading. In fact, you may find your cell phone user agreement more entertaining reading. I mean, all 14 pages of it. Maybe you don't find all those genealogies very enjoyable reading. Perhaps you may be even tempted to skip over them. Nevertheless, they speak powerfully to us in more ways than one. Though they teach lessons of various kinds to the person who is willing to study, one thing stands out pretty clearly. And you don't need to be a Bible scholar to understand it. Notice how in sacred scripture we see carefully preserved genealogies. I dare say some of us will be hard pressed to go beyond two, three generations. Even if you have something like ancestry.com or whatever. But yet, some of them can trace their ancestry back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Generation after generation of ancestral records passed from one generation to another all throughout Scripture. In fact, most of the book of 1 Chronicles contains exactly that kind of information. It may not excite you, but it has a powerful message that speaks to this generation. We as a people cannot underestimate the power of identity. We in this generation may not know who, where, or who we came from. We have lost our sense of heritage. Each generation is adrift, floating aimlessly through time in a sea of the unknown. In so doing, we drift farther and farther from our identity as those marvelous, unique creations who are made in the very image of God. And yet, the Jewish people knew the value of heritage and carefully preserved their ancestral records because they knew this gave them a clear sense of who they were as God's covenant people. 
Allow me to share with you an account that will help you to understand how one's identity has a powerful impact on life. This is an excerpt from America's Real War by Rabbi Daniel Lappin, an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. He writes about an experience that someone close to him had, and I quote, let me tell you what happened to one of my teachers, a rabbi, a great rabbi. On a trip to Israel, he found himself seated next to one of the heads of the Israeli socialist labor movement. Soon after the plane took off, one of my teacher's students, several, seated several rows behind, came forward and said, Rabbi, let me take your shoes. I have your slippers here. You know how your feet swell on the airplane. A few minutes later, that same student returned and said, here are the sandwiches that your wife sent. I know you do not like airline food. This went on in similar fashion for some time, and finally the head of the Israeli Socialist Labor Party turns to him and said, I don't get this. I am so impressed with your son. I have four sons. They've gr they're grown up by now, but in all my life, I don't recall them ever offering to do anything like that for me. Why is your son doing all of this? And the rabbi said, that's not my son. If that was my son, he would be showing me even more deference. But you must not blame yourself. Your sons are faithful to your teaching, and my sons are faithful to my teaching. It's simple, you see. You made the decision to teach your sons that they are descended from apes. That means that you are one generation closer to an ape than they are. And that means that it's only proper and appropriate that you should acknowledge their status and that you should serve them. But you see, I chose to teach my sons that we all came from God himself. And that puts me one generation closer to God, one gener generation closer to ultimate truth than they are, which means it's only appropriate that they treat me accordingly. If you don't know where you came from, you will likely not where, know where you are going in life. Perhaps this explains why so many of our young people lack direction and purpose. However, if you have a clear sense of where you came from, then everything else in life becomes clear to you. So, it becomes, so what it comes down to is a firm sense of identity. Allow me to say it again that we live in a generation adrift. People don't know who they are anymore. And that's one of Satan's greatest accomplishments. He has put a question mark where God has put a period. And that has caused a great deal of confusion in our day. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Period! But Satan put a question mark there. Did God really create the heavens and the earth? Maybe it all came as a result of a Big Bang. Maybe we all evolved from lower forms of life by mere happenstance. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them, period. But Satan put a question mark there. Did God really make them male, male and female? Maybe you're not what you appear. Maybe you're trapped in the wrong body. The more people try to find answers inside themselves, the more they end up farther and farther from truth. And that's why we need a faithful testimony. We need people who can declare the truth to a lost generation. However, in order for you to have a faithful testimony, you need to know what you are talking about. And that's what we will discuss here today. You see, God can equip you to become an effective witness for him. Perhaps you may be thinking, well, who am I that God should use me? I'm not a fiery figure like John the Baptist. I'm just an ordinary person. How can I be a witness that has any impact that would cause people to listen? You don't need a lot of hype. You don't need a lot of sensationalism. As I said before, in order to have a faithful testimony, you have to know what you're talking about. And in order to know what you're talking about, you have to know who you are. You need a clear sense of identity. 
When you're clear about who you are and what you know, you can speak with clarity and conviction. So today, I'd like to talk to you about four things that you need to know to be a faithful witness. First of all, you need to know where you came from. Though this may sound obvious to you, allow me to explain specifically what I mean. Too often we make assumptions about people and where they came from, and, uh, and in so doing that, we leave ourselves open to misunderstanding and perhaps even error. Just because someone says they come from God doesn't make it so. Jesus had this to say, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. He said again in verse 20, thus you shall recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day you will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to you, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, allow me to point out something here. And, and just bear with me. I know it looks as if John the Baptist came out of nowhere. But it took 30 years to prepare John the Baptist. The Gospel of Luke gives us his backstory. He was raised by Zacharias and Elizabeth. I'm talking two old school parents. For 30 years, those two old timers, they trained him, they discipled him, and they invested in him so that when his time came, he was ready. So what was John the Baptist doing all those 30 years? Well, he was probably doing a lot of household chores. He was serving and learning to minister by being a servant, much like the young man in Rabbi Lappin's story. After all, he had two elderly parents. They couldn't go hauling water for themselves. And they shouldn't have needed to with a strong young son. Listen, long before I was a preacher, I was shoveling snow for the church. And no one had to ask me to do it. I knew my pastor. You know how pastors, you know these, these guys in ministry, they're stubborn, man. Let me tell you about these guys. These, let me tell you something about these pastors. They are stubborn, he, stubborn middle-aged man. Sound familiar here? <laughs> stubborn middle-aged man. And I knew he would be out there shoveling because it had to be done. But you want to know something? You don't need to be ordained to shovel snow. So I made a promise. I said, as long as I am in that church, that man will never touch a shovel. And so I would shovel my mom out. I would shovel her snow. Call the parson and say, may I have the keys to the church? Come over and shovel. Every single snowfall would shovel for the church. I just did that as unto the Lord. And I made good on that promise. Whenever it snowed, I would shovel the snow. And I did a lot of other kinds of service behind the scenes for years long before stepping in a pulpit. I mean, I'm talking cutting grass, wrapping missionary boxes, scrub toilets, clean vomit. Listen, remember, long before Elisha was a prophet, he poured water on the hands of Elijah, meaning that he was a servant to Elijah. Long before Joshua led Israel into the promised land, he was a servant and an assistant to Moses. So show me that you are willing to wash feet and serve behind the scenes, okay? We got a food pantry, they'd be, la- <laughs> they'd be welcome to it, right? I mean, those folks work hard. They work hard for the glory of God. Some of, I mean, you know what I'm trying to say? Some of you know what I'm talking about, too, because I see what you do behind the scenes. I see what you do that other people may not see, and I see you are working hard, painting the youth room or working outside and working on that hallway out there or any number of things. Show me you're willing to work hard and do the work that supports the ministry that takes place on Sunday. Show me you're willing to work hard and get your hands dirty. Show me you're willing to wash feet. And to our young people, and I'm saying, I say this, I want to offer a word of advice, but, and I say this lovingly, I'm not, I'm not, getting, I'm not being a wise guy here. Before you change the world, show me that you can pick up your dirty clothes, take out the trash, and make your bed. <laughs> this leads me to another thing you need to know to be a faithful witness. You need to know who you are not. 
John's activity attracted the attention of Jewish leadership in Jerusalem, who sent emissaries, or I would say inquisitors, as if it were, to find out why John was baptizing. And John answered them very plainly, who he was and who he wasn't. He answered the unspoken question behind their inquiry by explaining emphatically that he was not the Christ. He also denied that he was Elijah the prophet that Moses, or the prophet that Moses foretold, would come. Although he came in the spirit and power of Elijah, he was not the reappearance or a reincarnation of that prophet. He was not Elijah come back to life. Leon Morris makes an important point here. The Jews remembered that Elijah had left the earth in a chariot of fire without passing through death. And they expected that in due course, the identical figure would reappear. John was not Elijah in this sense. He had no option but to deny who he was, to deny that he was. And of course, we must bear in mind the possibility that John may not even realize that he was Elijah. No man is what he is in his own eyes. I repeat, no man is what he is in his own eyes. He really is only as he is known to God. John was very emphatic about who he was not. He was not trying to be someone or something more than God intended. This stands in stark contrast to how people generally characterize themselves, especially in a social media age. More often than not, people will embellish their credentials and exaggerate their achievements. Isn't that often what happens on resumes and in job interviews? People make themselves out to be more than they really are. Problem is that someday someone will have, expect you to live up to those words. On the other hand, John the Baptist was not trying to be someone he was not. This gave him a platform to clarify who he was. He was a voice crying out into the wilderness to prepare the way for another. He was not promoting himself or trying to generate a personal following. And this set him apart from everyone else. Next thing you need to know to be a faithful witness is you need to know who you are in Christ. Look with me at verses 24 through 28. Word of God says, now they had been, now they had been sent from the Pharisees, the people who were questioning John. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. These priests and Levites were sent to give an account to John and his ministry and his purpose. For this reason, they had to ask why he baptized if he himself wasn't the Christ. For this reason, um, and... In other words, they could not understand why he's doing all of this. If he's not trying to promote a following or to amass um, people to, to a following to, to, to come after him. So they asked him because they could not discern his spiritual calling. Well, they came to the right place because, as noted earlier, he had a very clear sense of who he was and what God had called him to do. The clarity of that mission and purpose served to guide him well. Having a clear understanding of his calling and mission enabled him to communicate his purpose with conviction and authority. How about you? Do you have a sense of who you are in Christ? Do you have a clear idea regarding your purpose? Perhaps the reason you lack conviction is you lack clarity. Now, I'm not talking about some kind of self-image enhancement. Instead, I'm talking about discovering your God-given purpose in life. I'm talking about receiving a revelation of who you are in Christ. All of the promises that are involved in that. When those things come together for you, they will make you an effective instrument in God's hands. John acknowledged his humble position in relation to one who would eventually follow. He himself saw him, he saw himself not as a colleague or a peer, but a humble servant sent to prepare the way for the Lord.
as it said in Isaiah's prophetic word. Every mountain would be brought low, the proud and arrogant would be humbled, every valley would be exalted, meaning the humble will be elevated, and the rough or crooked places would be made uh, plain or straight, the corrupt and sinful being called to repentance. I'm quoting Warren Wearsby, who wrote, John had nothing to say about himself because he was sent to talk about Jesus. Jesus is the word. John was but a voice, and you cannot see a voice. John pointed back to Isaiah's prophecy and affirmed that he, Jesus, was the fulfillment. And finally, the fourth thing you need to know to be a faithful witness is you've got to know with assurance who Jesus is. Let's take a look at verses 29 through 34. Word of God says, the next day he, John, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This was he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit of God descending and remaining, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Did you notice that throughout this passage, words like testify and witness Almost sounds like a legal disposition. He is a faithful witness. When John saw Jesus, he had a revelation, and it identified him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He perceived Christ's redemptive mission. Though he was the Christ, he came in humility to serve, not to be served or to claim rank or privilege. John also realized that Christ's superiority extended because of his divine nature. He saw him as the eternal one, one who existed before him and before all of creation. He was higher in rank than John because he was higher in rank than all. Note how John's baptism served not only as a way of preparing hearts for Christ, but also as a means of revelation. He himself didn't recognize him as of yet, but by means of John fulfilling his calling, Christ was revealed to him. In other words, because he acted in faithfulness, he received greater revelation. So then, his ministry was a necessary component to the revelation of Christ. For he said, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. And it goes to show the importance of knowing and fulfilling one's own divine assignment. God gave him a very clear mission by which he would recognize the Son. Specifically, he would see the Spirit descending from heaven and resting upon him like a dove. God knows how to communicate with each of us. In their book, Hearing God's Voice, Henry and Richard Blackaby mention how God spoke to the Magi in a way that they could understand, even though they were not as trained in the Hebrew Scriptures as the priests and the Levites. They were able to discern God's voice and find Christ. John was able to discern God's voice, and as such, he was positioned to receive divine revelation. John knew God and had a relationship with him. This revelation and knowledge of the one who, who gave it enabled him to testify with conviction about God's Son. That made him a very credible and authoritative witness. Now, there is something of a learning curve in all of this. Even the prophet Samuel needed to learn how to discern the voice of God. And we're all in a learning process. Do you know the meaning of the word sophomore? Well, the word sophomore comes from two Greek words, sophos and moros. Sof, sophos, or sophos, sophos, means to be wise. Moros is a word from which we get moron. Moros means stupid, blockheaded, or a fool. So the word sophomore means wise fool, which leads me to make this point. 
when you know these things, you realize how much you still need to learn. 200 years ago, there was another man named John. He was a preacher of extraordinary power and influence in England and in America. We know about John Wesley, who was the founder of the Methodists, but this was another, uh, this was someone else. A man named George Whitfield was even more popular than John Wesley. He baptized more people into the kingdom, and he was a favorite preacher during that time, even among people like Benjamin Franklin. Well, Whitfield and Wesley were the best of friends. In fact, they even started something. They, they kind of had this, they had this group that was seeking God. They called it the Holy Club. And they were very close friends until there came a point where they had a severe falling out over Whitfield's strict adherence to his Calvinist doctrine. So Whitfield was asked one day about this falling out that he had with Wesley. He asked, do you expect to see John Wesley in heaven? Whitfield replies, no. And they said, yeah, that's what I thought you would say. He says, you know what, you, you don't understand what I'm saying. You see, John Wesley will be so much closer to the throne of God than I will be. I'll never see him. That's what we call divine humility. In all of this, we see what a humble man John the Baptist was. He said in verse 27 that he was not even worthy to untie the Lord's sandal strap or his shoelace. Despite how God used him in ministry, he still remained humble. That's an important lesson for us to remember. I want to take a moment to pray. I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Stand, please. And, you know, there are some times and there are some things that you really need to kind of settle or talk over with God himself. And so today, I'm going to pray. I'll give the benediction. You'll be dismissed if you want to, but if you may feel that you want to come and pray at the altar for a little bit. Maybe you need to process this. I want to give you that opportunity.